Welcome to C++ Weekly. I'm your host, Jason Turner. I'm available for code reviews, contracting, and on-site training. In this episode, I am going to discuss a little bit of Svine, which I don't think I've ever talked about on the channel before, and I'm going to move from that into what concepts bring us, and this will be a high-level introduction to concepts with the terse syntax, which fortunately we have available to us now in um, C++ 20 and on GCC trunk and on Clang uh, concepts branch. So let's see what we find here. Now let's say I wanted to write a function that can take any two floating point values that have to be the same. So I'm going to use a template. Now I would like to point out, and something here that I've really been trying to drive home with my students is, we always have this tendency to make our templates with just a T, or a U, or a V. We can um, go ahead and say, like, you know, give it a meaningful name of some sort. That's certainly allowed when it comes to template type parameters. So let's just add these two values together. Now, I've kind of minimized up the assembly window here because we really just care about the compiler output at the moment. Now, if I wanted to execute this code with two integers, that's going to compile just fine. If I want to execute it with an integer and a double, I'm going to get a no matching function call with an int and a double because this float right here, template parameter, requires these two to be the same thing. Now, if I wanted to limit this to floating point types, I'm going to pull in the type traits header. And now I'm going to do this SVINA thing. And SVINA stands for substitution failure is not an error. And basically it means that you can put in a requirement during overload resolution, if a requirement for a function is not met, then that function is simply removed from the overload set, and it moves on and it looks for another function in the overload set. That's the crux of Svine. Now, the reality of it is that it's always been a terrible mess to use, and I think it's one of these things that wasn't even really designed, it just kind of happened and then became part of the standard. So it's going to look something like this. I can say type name equals, now I'm not giving this a type name, enable if t, so this is going to return a type, and it needs a boolean value. So the boolean that I'm going to put in here is is floating point v float. I'm going to shrink this window a little bit. Now, I'm still getting a compile error because I'm passing it two different types. But what this is saying is I want to enable this function if this thing called float is in fact a floating point. And so this underscore v here is a shortcut that returns the colon colon value from the type trait, and this underscore t is a type as a shortcut that returns the um, colon colon type from the type trait. So this is a type, which is why it's being assigned to a type name, and this is a value, which is boolean, which is a compile time constant, which is why this is being sent to the enable if t. Okay, so now I am going to call this with two integers, which as we saw before, did compile. But now I get this error. Warning, uh, error, no function match for calling this. This template argument deduction substitution fails and we see here in the enable ft that's where it failed now if you don't know how to read this code then it's really hard to read and it's really annoying so um, that is Svine in a nutshell it's hard to read yeah let's just go with that so what we're getting with C20 in the form of concepts is going to look well it has several different ways that it can look one way is that we can put an explicit requires clause here, and I can say so I have this requirement here that says that is floating point. It says note the expression 
is floating point float evaluated to false. So this is what I get here. Constraints not satisfied, required by the constraints of this template, blah, 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 evaluated to false. Requires is floating point float. Okay, so this is a slightly more readable error because the very first line, the error line says, requires is floating point float with float equals int with unsatisfied constraints. So now we can go back to giving this two to floating point values and we should see it compiling again, which we do. Now, this is the first syntax that requires can give us. We can also say here in our template parameter, we can give it a concept in our template parameter. So we can't give it a type trait, but we can give it a concept. And our concepts can actually be pretty straightforward. Uh, there we go again with the T. Now, this doesn't read very well, so for concepts, we probably want to drop the is. And I believe if we do this, then we can see this. Um, it makes sense. This is a type. It is a floating point type, in fact. And if we don't satisfy the constraint, then we get the same kind of error here. We get no matching function call for this. It requires a floating point float and deduce conflicting types for parameter float. Okay, so these are two different types. Let's go ahead and give it two different integers. And now we see the requirement uh, evaluates to false here on our floating point uh, with float equals int. Okay, so maybe it's still not 100% easy to read, but we're getting somewhere. Now, the next thing that we can do with the terse syntax that we were uh, had in accepted into the standard a couple of standards meetings ago is going to end up looking something like this. And now we're going to get the same error again. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put this back to some sort of matching floating point values to show you that it does in fact compile. So now with this terse syntax, we are saying we are implicitly creating a template function and it is uh, denoted with this auto parameter here. And we have this saying, this is a floating point auto of your choosing. This is a floating point auto of your choosing. Now, the thing that we have suddenly lost silently that we maybe if we weren't paying attention, we didn't know it. Let's go back to the version here. If I make this, one of them a float and one of them a double, this doesn't compile because that's a float and a double and it's being passed to a function that's expecting the same type twice. I have one template parameter here. Now if I go back to our terse syntax where I can say floating point auto, And you can already start to see what's happening here. Uh, I don't need the template parameter anymore. Now I am asking for any two different floating point values. They can both be doubles, floats, long doubles, mismatch of any of these things. What we just can't have is we can't have an integral and a double passed in here. That's going to fail to compile and it's not going to meet our constraints. Now the final things here that were uh, have yet to discuss with this terse syntax is I can in fact specify that the return type itself must be floating point. So let's go ahead and give it this couple of values here. And so the return type must be floating point. Now if I were to do an explicit construction of an integer from these return types, I should expect a I don't get a compile error where I would have expected one. I have specified that this is a floating report, a floating point return type, but I'm giving an integer. I don't know if that is a bug in the compiler or not. So let's go ahead and check out our playing concepts branch. See what it does. Aha. We actually get 
an error here. Deduce type int does not satisfy the floating point. So it looks like Clang's experimental concepts branch, um, thank you to Sar Raz for that one, uh, seems to be more in line with what we would have expected from our compiler error. So let's go back and let this do this. Now, the next thing that we can do with our terse syntax is actually say I need this local value to be an automatically deduced floating point type of some sort. So I'm going to remove this constraint and I'm going to go back to this returning an integer and now I'm going to get this, well, I get the double cannot be narrowed here. So let's take away the braced initialization and go in parenthesized initialization, uh, function style cast of the value here. Um, I get this deduce type int does not satisfy the is floating point constraint. So that's what we've got with our concepts and with the terse syntax and with constraints, we can constrain parameters, return types, and values. And all of this is an order of magnitude more readable than anything that we could have gotten with Sfine. Now I'd say it's still up in the air exactly as to what the best practices are for where and how and when we should use constraints. Um, although uh, discussions I've had say that we should probably use them everywhere that we can because this helps make our code more correct. We don't have any questions about what the code is doing. And for those of you who don't like auto because you say it obscures the type of the value, well, we can still get the power of auto and some of the discussion about what the type is. Now, of course, the only question we have remaining is do we put the const here or do we put the const here? Oh, nope, can't put the const there. Do we put the const here? Okay, you have to decide. There's many places that the const could go in this code. So uh, thanks for watching this episode of C++ Weekly. It went on a bit longer than I expected it to, but I hope you learned something about Sfine, concepts, and the terse syntax. And also a shout out to everyone who's been working on getting this compiler support in Clang and GCC.